Yeah. Okay. Great. So Anna, so you can start whenever you are ready. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tang, for the invitation to uh, tell you all a little bit about um, the research that we do in my lab. So as he said, I'm Professor Ana Maria Porras. I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. I have been at UF for about two and a half years. Um, it took a long time for my lab to get started. So in a way it feels sometimes like I only just now arrived. Um, our lab is located in the new engineering building, meaning not the literal new West engineering building in, in NEB. Um, and so, and in my lab, we study host microbe interactions at the tissue level and primarily interactions that are mediated by the host or the human extracellular matrix. Um, and so today I'm gonna tell you about most of the work that we do in the lab is related to the human gut microbiome. That's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, but just so you know, in case you're interested, um, we also have some projects in the lab related to tropical parasitic infections. So we also study parasites and microbes that are more on the pathogenic side as well. Okay, so before we get started with this, just to get an idea of who's in the room, I'm gonna ask you a few questions and hopefully you can respond in the chat. Um, I would love to know what people know, if anything, about the human extracellular matrix or ECM. And so if you know anything about it, type whatever you know in the chat. If you don't know anything, you can type, I don't know anything, and that's okay. I can go through that in a little bit more detail. That will just give me a little bit of a better idea on how much detail to go in in the background. And I, I know there's always a lag, so I'll wait for a few minutes. Okay, cool. So... Okay, we have a range of things. So Daniel, thank you for being honest. No biggie, I'll go through it in a second. Um, yeah, as Cole said, the ECM. So basically, if you think about like a tissue and that could be, a tissue could be anything. It could be a piece of skin, it could be bone, it could be, well, in the case of what we're going to discuss here. Okay, Laura, Laura says, I have heard about the ECM, but you don't know much about it. Okay, this is great. Um, and so, Regardless of whatever organ or tissue you're talking about in the human body, you're going to have cells and then you're going to have a bunch of stuff that's outside of the cell, right? Um, a collection of cells on its own would not be able to hold its shape, would not be able to withstand me the mechanical forces that, for example, bone experiences and things like that, okay? So the extracellular matrix is basically everything in a human tissue that is not a cell. So it's all this stuff that's outside of the cell. Um, let me go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask you that question later. Yeah. I forgot to add a couple more slides there, but I can just explain in that way. And what roles does the extracellular matrix play? A bunch of them. So as I was saying right before, uh, some of it is structural. So some of its roles have to do with withstanding mechanical forces. Um, and that could be tension or it could be, for example, in the skin, you can see like our skin gets pulled in a bunch of different directions. And so then the extracellular matrix helps these tissues withstand tension, but it could also be compression. For example, when you walk on your spine, the, the bones in your spine are like constantly experiencing those compressive forces. The extracellular matrix plays an important role in those structural and mechanical parts, functions of tissues. But it also serves a biochemical or biological role in that the extracellular matrix can signal to our cells, human cells, a bunch of different things, and then get those cells to do a series of different functions. And uh, the ECM is actually so important that it is dysregulated or there's like abnormal things happening in the extracellular matrix in a wide variety of diseases across the human body. In my case, every single disease I have ever studied in my career is associated with the extracellular matrix. Um, yes, and other things from what y'all said, um, it consists, so what actually is it? It is made up of a bunch of different components. Um, some things that you have maybe heard about before, for example, collagen. Uh, a lot of people have heard of collagen. If you haven't heard of collagen, you've eaten collagen, because for example, Jell-O 
is degraded collagen, it's gelatin that's degraded collagen. Um, another really famous one that women in particular have often heard about is hyaluronic acid, because that's a really common component in um, facial creams that we use. It's a component that can absorb a lot of water, so it is very hydrating. That's why it is used in those types of products. But yeah, as other people have said, fibronectin, laminin, and each of those components play a different type of role. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those components in a second. Okay, mm -hmm. then second question. So today we're also going to talk about inflammatory bowel disease and the gut microbiome. So I am imagining that probably either because of your participation in this class or honestly because you consume regular media and you, if not, you maybe have seen it on social media, you probably know at least a little bit about the gut microbiome, right? So it's like a collection of microorganisms. For the purposes of today, we're really only going to talk about bacteria, but it could be more than just bacteria. It's a collection of um, microorganisms that live in our guts, in our intestines specifically, again, for the context of this particular talk. Um, so we're gonna talk about that and we're also gonna talk about inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. And again, type again in the chat, have y'all heard, what kinds of things have you heard about IBD? maybe through friends that you know that who suffer from IBD, maybe you yourself are an IBD patient. Um, I don't know, I'm just curious what kinds of things people have heard about IBD or things that you know are related to IBD. Yeah, Erica says, Isabel says, inflammation agreed. Um, issues with your bowels in general. Yeah, some of these disorders are pretty painful for patients. Um, yeah, and as Erica said, this great intro to my next slide, um, inflammatory bowel disease is actually a collection of disorders that can happen in the gut. Um, and the two most common types of disorders that are encompassed within this really broad term are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And so people often, when we talk about IBD, think about inflammation, a lot of the things that y'all are saying right now, inflammation, pain. Uh, some people know that there are changes in the gut microbiome that happen in patients who suffer from IBD. But one thing that a lot of people don't think about is again, getting to this idea of the extracellular matrix is that there is a lot of extracellular matrix remodeling, meaning changes in the ECM. And that is uh, actually a pretty big hallmark of these types of diseases. And so let me show you right here what I mean. So we have different kinds of extracellular matrix in um, gut tissue. So what you're looking at here is almost as if you took like a cross section of a piece of colon or, or small intestine. Um, and so you have your epithelial cells right here. And these are the host cells that are in charge of keeping that barrier in the intestines intact. And then you have one type of extracellular matrix here that's called the basement membrane that sits right underneath the epithelium, okay? And the function of that type of extracellular matrix is to ensure that that barrier is as tightly sealed as possible. And then kind of not picture here, maybe picture here in these collagen fibrils. Underneath all of that, there's even more ECM that plays more of a structural role as I was mentioning before. In inflammatory bowel disease, in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, we see two types of modifications that happen in the extracellular matrix. So we can see one process that is called fistulization, and this is when there is excessive degradation of the extracellular matrix or breakdown of the extracellular matrix, and that can cause literal holes to happen in the intestines of those patients. As you can imagine, and as Cole said, this can have pretty serious consequences for the patients. But at the same time, we can also have kind of the opposite problem, which is excessive deposition or production of extracellular matrix and specifically of collagen. And that's called fibrosis. And while it happens in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, this is really, really common in Crohn's disease. Um, and what ends up happening is that this kind of massive tissue buildup happens in the intestines and patients can no longer pass stool. Uh, that, again, as I said, super painful for the patients. The, really the only options there are surgical resection. And so just generally speaking, just establishing that ECM remodeling is a major hallmark of IBD, even though it's something that is not often talked about. 
So again, this remodeling or um, modifications to the extracellular matrix are carried out by proteases. And proteases are enzymes that um, degrade proteins. And in this particular case, we're talking about enzymes that are capable of degrading extracellular matrix proteins like collagen, like laminin, like fibronectin, okay? Uh, proteases have recently, literally recently, because it's in the last three years, have begun to be proposed as markers of IBD. And that's because in both of these cases, um, researchers were looking at the either abundance or activity of different types of proteases in stool that was obtained from healthy and Crohn's disease or and ulcerative colitis patients, or here in the right, these are healthy controls versus patients that are pre and ulcerative colitis flare up and after that flare up. And we can see in both of these cases is an increase in that protease activity in the stool of those patients. Now, the traditional thinking historically, when people have looked at this problem and you can see it even from the cartoon I showed you, what people have usually thought is that these proteases are produced by the host cells. So they're produced by maybe immune cells or a type of cell type found in the human gut and in a lot of human tissues called fibroblasts. Um, and that it is our human cells that are secreting these proteases and causing a lot of these extracellular matrix remodeling. Now, when I was a postdoc, I started learning more about inflammatory bowel disease, learning more about extracellular matrix remodeling in this disease context. And one of the things that I learned is that we know that human pathogens or human bac bacterial pathogens in other contexts, so for example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the lung can hijack this process of remodeling host extracellular matrix to facilitate invasion into deeper tissues. And so we know that pathogens do it. We know that pathogens have the ability to directly interact with human extracellular matrix. Um, and so my thought thinking, and I don't know if you all have talked about this throughout the semester, but um, pathogenic bacteria are not that different from, from commensal or like good for you bacteria. It's really more about being in the right place at the right time or wrong, wrong place, wrong time type of difference between um, pathogens and commensals, especially in the gut. And so my hypothesis that I came up with after reading a little bit of the literature, realizing that there's not a ton out there on commensal bacteria and their interactions with the ECM, is that what we think of as commensal bacteria or like bacteria that normally are found in our gut microbiome do have the ability to remodel gut ECM and that those changes that they do to the ECM, because the ECM is so important for so many different processes, could then drive or maybe worsen colonic inflammation. And so there wasn't, there was some evidence in the literature that this could maybe happen, but not a ton. So the first step was really in proving that this could happen period in the, in the lab, right? And so my first question was whether commensal bacteria can degrade different individual components of gut extracellular matrix in vitro, in the laboratory, in very artificial settings. And so what I did is the postdoc lab I worked in had a ton of different species of bacteria in the freezer that are normally found in the human gut. And so I went through those strains, went through the literature and identified a bunch of different bacteria based on a series of criteria. So first I identified bacteria that we know can degrade mucin or mucus, and that's a protective lining in the intestines. Um, and mucus is really similar to some of the components it found in the extracellular matrix, like hyaluronic acid that I mentioned earlier. And so that's, for example, the case of Acromansia mucinifila. I also chose other bacteria that maybe you have heard about, like Bifidobacterium longum and Lactobacillus, that are usually thought of more as probiotic. And if you, I don't know the what you all do in the audience, I should have maybe pulled you on that. But some people regularly consume probiotics and these are the types of bacteria that are normally found in those pills or even in yogurt and things like that. I also chose a species of bacteria like Bacteroides and Prevotella that are really abundant in the guts of people, both in the global north and in the global south. 
And finally, I chose a bacterium, Ruminococcus navis, that has been associated pretty heavily with Crohn's disease and has been implicated in the initiation of inflammatory bowel disease. So kind of a wide range of um, bacteria. And then I also went through all the different extracellular matrix components that are found in the gut and identified some that I could test in the laboratory that are important, but that I could also easily um, identify assays that I could do very quickly in the lab. So these include chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid, which are glycosaminoglycans. That, that means they're not really proteins. They're more like sugar-like molecules. Um, then proteins that I had already mentioned, like laminin, a couple of different types of collagen, and fibronectin. Again, more ECM proteins that are abundant in the gut. So I, yeah, I skipped this slide here, but essentially, if you all want me to go into more details, I can do so later. But for each of these um, proteins or glycosaminoglycans, I identified a particular assay that we could do, that I could do in the lab, relatively quickly. Um, my grad students now here at UF um, have adapted some of those, evolved some of those, but these are assays that we could do really quickly in 96 world plates um, and that I could read, that we can read a, on a plate reader either by measuring absorbance or fluorescence. So some of these are truly quantitative assays. Uh, many of them are relative quantitation. And so, for example, I'm going to show you what the results of one of those tests looks like. So this is, for example, this is actually a quantitative test. This is what happens when we look at chondroitin sulfate degradation. And so what you're seeing here in this graph is in the y-axis, the higher, the larger that bar is, the more degradation there is. And the lower it is, the less degradation there is. And these are all normalized. Each bacteria was grown in the media that it, that particular bacterium liked. And each of these results are um, controlled, are like background subtracted from the specific media. Strains that are closing, that are the same color, belong to the same species. Uh, the, not sorry, not same species, same genera, same genus. Um, and the closer the bacteria are to each other, the more or less, more similar they are phylogenetically speaking. And so, but when, oh uh, yeah, and last little piece uh, to understand this type of graph, because um, not everybody's familiar with this, um, this way of denoting statistical significance means that every graph, every bar that has uh, the letter A on them, those um, experimental groups are not statistically significantly different from each other. Whereas if uh, two bars have two different letters, that means they are statistically significantly different from each other. Okay, having established that, this is how you interpret this type of data, right? So we can see that a lot of our probiotic strains like B. longum, Lactobacillus gasseri, Lactobacillus ruteri, um, these bacteria are not that interested, at least under these conditions, in degrading extracellular matrix. And on the other hand, we see that species of the Bacteroides genus in particular seem to be really good at degrading chondroitin sulfate. We see that mucin degraders like as a, um, like a mucin acromancia mucinifila and ominococcus navis can also degrade chondroitin sulfate. So we repeated that, like I said, with all of these different ECM components, I'm just showing you here another example with fibronectin. And then when we put them all in one same graph, what we can see generally speaking is that for every single one of the extracellular matrix components uh, that we explored, at least one bacteria would degrade that extracellular matrix component, right? And in most cases, different species, multiple species of bacteria were capable of degrading that host extracellular matrix component. That's the first finding. The second thing that we saw is that a lot of those so-called probiotic strains really don't have any interest in degrading these extracellular matrix components, um, at least under the conditions that we tested. And the third thing that we saw is that some species of bacteria are pretty good degraders of extracellular matrix. And this includes all of our bacteroidae species, our Ruminococcus navis um, bacteria here in the darker green, 
as well as to some extent, um, Ackermansia, Mucinifila, and Prevotella copper. Anna, so, the, Anna yes. yeah. So those are very exciting results. So the bacteria, different bacteria can degrade uh, ECM. In turn, it can modulate the mechanical environment in the coolant, in the coolant, in the body, in the for the human body environment, micro environment. And then if there are <clears throat> if there are cancer cells, can the cancer cell, other cells, they actually will respond to those uh, <clears throat> change the mechanical environment. So then that means that if you can you can guide or or you can regulate those bacteria, you can actually in turn regulate cancer cells in the body through changing their degrading their ECM. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's you basically just outlined all the aims of the grants I have recently written. That's excellent. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah. So what's the is there any way people can explore to communicate with those bacteria to to let to let those bacteria to do the the things we want them to do? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. So that's some of the things we're trying to understand in the lab now, because mm -hmm. we know that this is happening, and I can show you more data in a sec. Um, Great. Right now, we don't yet, we're starting to get these answers, but we don't yet know what specific enzymes are being secreted by the bacteria. So that will be important um, because then you can think about maybe introducing engineered strains into the microbiome to try to modulate that, or maybe treating patients with inhibitors for specific enzymes. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause sometimes it's really hard to knock out a whole function of the microbiome that can be really hard. But maybe if we instead can treat patients with inhibitor, locally treat them for inhibitors, um, that would be another thing. Another thing we're starting to look at, and I don't think I have I don't think I have, let me see. I don't think I have that data in this presentation. Um, mm -hmm. But another thing that is really interesting that I think mm -hmm. in the microbiome field is only now gaining a lot of traction is mm -hmm. that I show you data between species, but I didn't show you data between strains. Mm -hmm. See if I have it at the end. Um, yeah, right here. So this was our attempt at starting to look at strain level differences in um, the results that I just showed you. And mm -hmm. so like in teal, these are different strains of the same species of bacteria, of Bacteroides fragilis. And then in the darker blue, these are different isolates from actual people um, mm -hmm. of Prevotella copri. And what you can see, especially for the Bacteroides, is that we do see strain level differences. So one of the projects we have in the lab right now, specifically for B. fragilis, is exploring that a little bit further and understanding even within the same species what makes one strain versus another want to degrade extracellular matrix more versus mm -hmm. another or like what genes specific genes are involved and because you can think yes you can use it as a treatment but we are thinking that heck maybe one day you could also use it as a diagnostic mm -hmm. to try to yeah. figure out hey if you have these particular strains maybe you are at a higher risk of having a worse prognosis in the future those are the types of questions like you're getting at exactly the types of questions we're super interested in exploring mm -hmm. that's great that's great in fact in my lab we have uh, some coolant human coolant cancer cells they are very sensitive to the mechanical environment they can change it Change to be, they can become very invasive when you slightly change the mechanical environment. So you, since your bacteria can do those, uh, those yeah. uh, radiation method, those uh, cancer cell can be a, can be a, um, can be a sign, can be a, can be a some sample to use to test this idea. Yeah. Yeah, that would be super cool. We should chat later. And and specifically in the strain level project that I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, we are specifically looking at. There's a type of Bacteroides fragilis called enterotoxigenic, and mm -hmm. that one is strongly associated with colorectal cancer. So what okay. we're doing right now, and literally right before this, I was chatting with somebody else because what we're trying to do, we have enterotoxigenic strains in the lab, mm -hmm. and I'm we are trying to find non-enterotoxigenic strains 
from mm -hmm. other people so that we can compare. Our hypothesis is that the because cancer is such an ECM remodeling disease, yeah. Um, yeah. our hypothesis is that the those enterotoxigenic strains have a higher ability to degrade mm -hmm. the ECM and that maybe that is part of what initiates metastasis or other things that could be happening in colorectal cancer. So we, yeah, we should definitely chat later. Definitely, <laughs> that's great. In, in the class, I explained to all the students about the, the mechanical force, mechanical environment. So I, I think, I believe that all the students will benefit from learning your lecture. And then they will, this will expand, expand their horizon. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Please continue your talk, very exciting. Yeah, no worries, yeah. it's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Like I said, the first part, the first answer to a, our first question was basically just establishing, is this possible at all? And the answer seems to be yes, at least in vitro. We have a long way to go to prove that it, this happens in vivo. Um, but again, I'm in a biomedical engineering department. So the question everybody always wants to know is whether the this phenomena that we're seeing, this bacteria-driven ECM degradation, could actually be clinically relevant. And so when I was doing my uh, postdoc at Cornell, we were able to work, uh, collaborate with Dr. Randy Longman at the Wild Cornell Medical College in New York City. And he sent us colonic lavage uh, samples from healthy and ulcerative colitis patients. So then we would take these samples, these microbiome samples, grow them up in two types of media, brain heart infusion broth right here on the left and gut microbiota medium. We would grow up our bacteria there then collect the supernatant from those samples and then take the supernatant from those samples to, through the exact same assays that we had tested before for um, our individual bacterial species, the data that I had just shown you. And so this is an example of what that data looks like. And the reason we tested two different types of media is because as you can imagine, the media formulation can severely um, impact the types of bacteria that grow in that media. And so what we found in gray, you're seeing the healthy patients and in the purplish blue, you are seeing our, our ulcerative colitis patients. And again, the higher up the bar is, the more degradation there is. As when you, And what you can see in these particular cases is that it doesn't matter whether we grew our samples in BHIS or in GMM medium, uh, regardless, we do see a higher proteolytic activity towards collagen 4 in the ulcerative colitis samples. We also see that uh, for laminin. And yes, and I'm not showing you this data here, but we also see it for chondroitin sulfate um, and for fibronectin. I think hyaluronic acid is the only exception where we don't see this increased um, proteolytic activity in the patients. So we were pretty excited about that. And so because also what this is suggesting as well is that if you remember way at the beginning when I showed you data of uh, protease activity in the stool of IBD patients, the people who wrote those papers were hypothesizing that those were proteases released by human cells that were released in the stool. And what we think our data is showing is that there is a strong possibility that those proteases are not only released by the hosts, but are also released by members of the gut microbiome. Uh, then the other thing that we wanted to do, and this is what I was getting at, we are slowly in the process of trying to figure out what kinds of proteases and what kinds of enzymes are being secreted by all of these bacteria. So what we did, I teamed up with somebody else in the lab and we did, um, we did proteomics on the supernatant uh, secreted by the individual bacteria that I showed you in the first little part of the talk. And I thought we were gonna find things like gelatinases, collagenases, kind of these very specific enzymes in the supernatants. And what we ended up finding was um, not really enzymes that were that specific. What we ended up finding are things like trypsin-like peptidase domains, Calpane cysteine proteases, again, trypsin. So what I mean by that, these metallopeptidases, um, and a lot of these are very poorly characterized, at least to his point. But what I mean by that is that a lot of these proteases were very general proteases. So proteases that can target a lot of different proteins. And so we are now 
slowly in the process, one of my students is in the process of running a lot of um, inhibitor studies to try to get at which specific enzymes are active and responsible for the degradation of what specific extracellular matrix component. The other thing that we did that our results could be clinically relevant is um, we went and found a metagenomic cohort of IBD that had both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease patients. And we try to identify whether any of these enzymes that we had previously identified with our proteomics were also found in, or the genes for those were also found in increased abundance in these IBD cohorts. And what we found is that not necessarily for all of them, but for several of them, like the, the trypsin-like peptidase domain, the peptidase family M23, which is a metalloprotease. These are just examples of nine of the proteases that we found that were in greater abundance in these IBD patients. And so again, the, while this doesn't necessarily prove that the proteases are clinically involved in the progression of the disease, they do at least provide further evidence that what we are seeing is something that is worth looking into and may be associated with disease progression. Then the last question that we had also towards trying to figure out whether this matter uh, at all once we go into a living organism was whether this bacteria-driven ECM degradation could maybe make colonic inflammation worse in vivo in an animal model. And so to answer this question, what we did is we decided to focus on three of the bacterial species that we had seen had pretty high uh, ECM degradation abilities. And those were Rominococcus navis, Bacteroides fragilis and Bacteroides theta iota omicron. So these three ones that, as you can see across our assays, were pretty active. And so I made a huge batch of supernatant from all of those. And then we went to the dextrin sodium sulfate colitis mouse model. And so in this mouse model, you add the substance dextrin sodium sulfate in drinking water in the mice. And that provokes um, kind of a, like a baseline inflammation levels in the gut. Um, and eventually, depending on the amount of DSS and the molecular weight of the DSS, um, you can either have acute or chronic colitis um, that can become pretty bad for the mice. So in our case, we wanted to induce kind of low levels of inflammation, not super terrible levels of inflammation, because our question was whether the supernatant would make that inflammation worse, whether the CCM degradation would make it worse. Sometimes people ask me, oh, why did you use DSS at all? And that is feeding the proteolytic supernatant alone in these otherwise super healthy mice and it wasn't enough to induce colitis and inflammatory bowel disease. So we did run a pilot experiment where we saw that. And so what we ended up doing is we would take the supernatant, meaning everything that was secreted into a culture from all of those different bacteria, from all those three different bacteria, and we would orally gavash, meaning orally administer um, it to the mice for every single day, starting three days prior to the mice having DSS in drinking water. And then we would continue to do that through the whole time that the mice received DSS treatment. And then the question was whether, again, whether does the supernatant make the dextrin sodium sulfate induced colitis and the inflammation symptoms worse? And then the answer to that is really complex. And so right now, uh, I'm showing you a graph that has the time after the start of DSS treatment. So if we go back, it's basically at this point, this is day zero. And then up here, this is a disease activity index which includes essentially, um, to calculate these, I, myself, and um, our lab manager, we would take a look at the mice and analyze them every single day and record observations on their different types of symptoms. So things like how runny was their stool, um, did they exhibit symptoms of distress, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can rate that in a scale, okay? And the first thing that you can see before I draw your attention to the part where I want you to draw to draw your attention to is in the dark gray, we see our control mice that were fed daily, just media that no bacteria were grown in. And you can see those mice were super happy, super healthy, no symptoms of inflammation. 
In the light gray, we see mice that were fed DSS. So they, they were induced to um, exhibit symptoms of colitis with that substance, but they were fed regular media. So media that was not touched by the bacteria, right? And then in our three teal, green, and pink colors, we have our three bacterial strains that degraded extracellular matrix a lot. So what you can see is that at the beginning, they're all pretty similar. It takes a while for the mice to start exhibiting symptoms, right? It's not immediate. You can see that by the end, all of the experimental conditions, even the ones with the supernatants from the three different bacteria, reach the same level of inflammation as our control DSS mice, the mice that received only media. But the interesting part is right here, shows up starting around day five, yeah, starting around day five, six, and seven. And that is that all of our mice that received uh, supernatant from those bacteria that are capable of degrading the extracellular matrix started to exhibit symptoms of inflammation sooner than if they didn't, right? So it doesn't necessarily make the final inflammation worse, but it does mean that you start experiencing the symptoms sooner. Um, and you can read a lot more about that in this paper that we published last year. Uh, there's a little bit more on the ability of those mice to recover, which is also made worse by the mice that received uh, the supernatant from that was highly proteolytic against the extracellular matrix um, components. And so to summarize my talk, um, one, I hope I was able to convince you that a culture supernatant of different, wide variety of different gut bacteria can degrade host extracellular matrix in vitro. That the microbiota of IBD patients is more proteolytically active compared to that of control patients, suggesting that the CCM degradation might be clinically relevant. And that bacteria during ECM degradation in our in vivo model accelerated colonic inflammation. Again, kind of supporting the hypothesis that this is relevant for disease progression in inflammatory bowel disease. And so in general, though, the biggest takeaway I, I want you to take from this is that interactions between bacteria and the host extracellular matrix may play an important role in the progression of IBD, yes, but also generally speaking in host microbe interactions and not just in the gut, but also in other parts of the body where um, bacteria or microbiomes regularly interact with uh, host tissues. And so with that, I want to thank the Brito lab. This is where I did this specific work. And then my lab, and we are currently, um, we're not quite ready to show data yet, but we, my student Karen in particular, has uh, taken over this project and is starting to ask a lot of really cool questions um, along the lines of what we were just discussing with Professor Ting. Uh, but we're excited to see where this takes us next. Thank you for That's your great. attention. That's great. Yeah. Let's thank uh, uh, Anna together. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I just want to see one thing, uh, Anna. In fact, uh, previously we in, we did some experiment for the bacteria. We <clears throat> we can look. We we have a a protein that it can be expressed on the bacteria's membrane, and then we and then that protein can sense the membrane voltage of the cell, including oh. bacteria. So then we see the bacteria actually they have for uh, they have for uh, cyclic increase and a decrease of membrane voltage. So they actually generate the, the spike in the on their surface. Uh -huh. That 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 uh, voltage change is uh, used by the bacteria to to expel the waste they used. So oh. by looking at the 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 cycle, the the cyclic change of membrane voltage of bacteria, in fact, we can infer their metabolism status. So I think maybe they can be linked to what you showed there, that you, you yeah. show that the activity of bacteria during the degradation of the ECM. During the degradation. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, we should definitely meet later and chat a little more. Okay. Because I think okay. there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, yeah, that is super interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And the, <clears throat> in the class, oh, by the way, all the students, all the students, by the way, we remember 
our homework we did uh, in the in the class that we calcul you ca you calculated the number of the bacteria in the body and then compare to the number of the cells in the body, right? So you you see the bigger bigger number of the bacteria in everybody's body. So that means bacteria is very important. So that's why the Dr. Anna Porras's research is so important to for us to find out a new way to regulate human physiology, right? And then to to tackle the pathology. Right. Yeah, and I think this is really important, and especially like in my discipline in biomedical engineering, mm -hmm. we are only really we are really only taught about the host. So we're only taught about like human cells, mammalian cell biology, and like the first time I started studying microbes was as a postdoc, and so it's really cool that your students are getting more exposure to a microbiological side of mm -hmm. things because I think um, that will become really important for the future of medicine. Definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. We need to look at the whole picture, not yeah. only the, not not only a cell in the body, but also bacteria, and also that the 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 interactions, the interaction maps between them. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, yeah. Any other questions from students? If no other question, let's thank Professor Porus again. Thank you. This yeah. is very fun. Thank, Thank you all for inviting me. Yeah, and I'm sure yeah. that the, that the Professor Paulus will uh, have an opening for new students. So if you guys have interest, you can directly contact her. Yeah. Yes, contact me. And if you're a master's student and you want to do research for credit, we are looking for a couple more people in the lab. So definitely contact me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I saw the text in the chat. Mary yes, C. I'm seeing Thank that. You. Thank you. It's not a question. Thank you. Yeah. Very Thank good. You. Very good. Okay. So I will see you, see all the students uh, Monday. Yeah. And uh, Anna, see you soon. Yeah. Mm. See you soon. Bye. See you. All. Yeah. Mm, bye now. Mm.